I want to jump right in this morning by reading to you from a text, a very familiar text to some of us. It comes at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. It's Jesus' final words recorded in this Gospel, and it's a commission to the church. Matthew 28, we're going to begin at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went into Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey, obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God, open your word to us. Open us to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a real familiar text, so there's so many ways you can come at it. And, and some things, you know, you could talk about baptiz baptism and how important it is. And in some churches, you'd be talking about the fact that it's the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, then uh, there's the issue of teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. The fact that Jesus is present with the church. I'm with you always to the very end of the age. But I'm going to be focusing in on all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, all ethnic groups, all cultures. Jesus just said to his disciples that he's going to make disciples, that they are to make disciples of all nations. So how would they have heard this? They... They were raised up in the life of Israel, and they had this image of a day would come that they would go back to the glory of the old days when Jerusalem was strong and they had a strong king, and from there they would rule the world. Israel would do its thing on a high hill, and it would be so powerful, it would be so attractive that essentially people would be coming from all over the world just to be part of it. And so, in their minds, reaching the world was essentially doing their own thing and telling people, join us to be like us. Become Jews. Join our religion. Join our nation. But Jesus wasn't saying that. He was actually turning that idea upside down. He said that they would go out, away from Israel. This becomes clear in the early part of the book of Acts in very explicit detail. Go out and make disciples in other nations. In just a few weeks, we'll be celebrating Pentecost. And on that day, the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples. And suddenly, you didn't have to speak Hebrew or Aramaic to hear about Jesus in a huge flash mob scene. Everyone heard the good news in their own language. It was an amazing moment. And those Christians, those people who then came to follow Jesus, would be able to be faithful to Jesus and would still be Greek and would still be Roman. We're in a sermon series about what would Jesus undo. And today we're going to look at how Jesus undoes the limits of culture and nationalism. Now, Israel wasn't wrong to expect a king. Jesus is the Messiah, the one king in all of history, divinely appointed by God to ultimately rule everything and everyone in every place. Jesus says it right here in verse 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. But that didn't mean that Jesus was nation building. He wasn't just trying to take the thing of Israel and make it bigger. It actually confronted Israel's nationalism, their whole conception of what it would be like to influence the nations. But it confronts every national loyalty not just Israel's. 
one of the earliest confessions of the church was Jesus is Lord. Countless people died because they said that and didn't say something else. Because this Jesus is Lord was a direct slap in the face of the Romans who ruled Israel and the peoples around them. Every civic-minded Roman would be willing to say, Caesar is Lord. And Christians wouldn't. It was a religious statement, and it was a political statement. Jesus is Lord is a religious statement, and ultimately, in history, and beyond history, it'll be a political statement. Commitment to Jesus was bigger than commitment to Rome. Commitment to Jesus was bigger than any one nation. It's bigger than any commitment to a cultural heritage. It's bigger than racial identity. All these things are important, and they can be beautiful. But they're not the most important things about us. So we've got to do a gut check. What's more important to your sense of identity? That you're an American? Or that you're Christian? That you're from Italian ancestry? Or that you're in God's family? That you're black or white or Asian? Or that you're forgiven? Jesus only is Lord. And recognizing that is part of being a disciple and recognizing that just might undo some of our nationalism. When are we tempted to confuse nationalism or culture with Christianity? When we think about missionaries going overseas, it seems like a bit of a no-brainer to recognize that people don't have to become Americans or Norwegians to be faithful to Jesus. Jesus is bigger than that. He's bigger than culture. And yet some of the earliest Protestant missionaries to Africa insisted that these early Christians there, many who were living in tropical jungles, they insisted that they dress in Scottish woolen clothes. You see, to these early missionaries, dressing this way was part of modesty. They looked at the beautiful traditions of clothing that were part of these tribes, and, and they considered it immodest. So dressing like Europeans in the minds of the missionaries was part of obedience to Jesus. They were confusing culture and nationalism with Christianity. They carried portable organs through the muddy jungles as they went place to place. Why? Because Christian music uses organs. Now, we're out of compliance with that right now. It was just part of their mindset. They thought that Christianity should lead to working together with European governments and corporations to build railroads and industries in these countries. Confusing culture ethnicity, nationalism, economic development with Christianity. Now, today we're more sensitive than that on the mission field. Most missionaries are sensitive to allowing every culture to worship Jesus, express its devotion in its own language, in its own music. But when we come home, This tendency to always expect people to become like us if they're serious about Jesus, it's it's harder to see when we're on our home turf. And yet it's often part of the way we think. It's so easy to just hang around with people who are like us. And that means that churches are often very culturally and even economically homogeneous. We don't have to deal with people whose way of thinking was shaped by living in a different part of the world, whose skin color is different, who view laws and policies different because they work in an office or they work in a factory or they were shaped by different life experiences. 
It's even come to the point where we can't understand how a person can be a Christian and vote for another political party. Living into the nature of, of the multicultural life of the church has never been easy. And the church has never been particularly strong of it in the United States. We have a long history of treating people badly. The way we treated Indian tribes in those early years, bounties on the heads of Indians on the West Coast. The way we decimated tribes and gave them diseases, and sometimes it was Christian pastors who were also involved in this. It came up with all the justifications we made about slavery long after England and other European powers began to struggle with it. So it's never been a strength. There have been great moments for the church. There have been bad moments. But right now, it's getting worse in some places. Time after time in the news, messages of American superiority or white superiority get couched in Christian language by people who claim to be Christian. And some of the people who are not Christ followers take a look at that, and they can't see a difference between someone who believes in Jesus and someone who's just prejudiced. And sometimes that's too true. A number of years ago, there was a small Presbyterian church north of Baton Rouge. It no longer exists. I've shared this a number of years ago with some of you. Near this church, there was some work being done, state work on the roads. And some of the workers in that stayed in trailers as they moved around the states because it was too far to drive home. They even stayed on site over the weekends. And so a number of these road workers decided to go to that Presbyterian church on a Sunday. Nothing bad happened until they were leaving. At that point, one of the leading women in the church came up to direct them to other churches in the community where they would fit better if they stayed another week because they were not welcome there. Now, was that a black-white thing? I don't know. The funny thing is, is it didn't have to be. It could have just as likely have been an all-white church and an all-white crew. The economic and educational differences might have been sufficient for this because prejudice works that way. But the church doesn't have to be this way. There's a church in our presbytery, Mount Paran, Presbyterian Church. It has the participation and leadership of people from, a, from all kinds of nations, despite the fact that they're a tiny church. Our own church plant, St. Moses, was founded on the values of wanting to pursue a multi-ethnic, multicultural reality for the church. Here at Central, for the last 25 or 30 years, it's been explicit that we value that nature of the church, the multicultural nature of the church. And we have a long way to go into living into this right, but it's something we have to constantly think about and constantly work on. So this command of Jesus to make disciples of all nations, it means that wherever it is, the church has to be looking out at the world, ready to declare the good news to every tribe and nation, to every kind of person, even those people different than us, and even make sacrifices to do it. And it means that churches, wherever they are, have to be ready to live into the multicultural, multi-ethnic nature of the church, right where they are. And so that means we have to work on our own prejudices, and that's not easy stuff. None of us are totally free from struggling with people who are different than we are. I've got the credentials of being a missionary. You know, I can, I can hold up my little badge. I still struggle. I still struggle with, with prejudices sometimes against Japanese people, and I lived there for 10 years. But I've always worked on it, and I've made a lot of progress. Now, we're in different places regarding our skills. 
in dealing with cross-cultural differences. Sometimes we say bigoted or insensitive things and don't even know it. Other people, and I envy these people, they seem to always do the right thing without even having to think about it. It's pretty much just reflex. But more often, we want to be friendly and sensitive, but we just don't know how to do it. So if we're going to do the right thing, we're going to have to think about it a bit. God has given Central Presbyterian Church a mandate, and I believe it is a mandate, to love and serve the neighborhoods we live in, all those different neighborhoods, to learn how to do that. But increasingly, the people who live around us are pretty different than us in some ways. They might be superficially the same. They might dress the same way, have the same hours, look the same. But their value system and the way they look at the world can be profoundly different. And then there's ethnic and racial diversity that's changing the world around us. And so this requires us to stop living as parishioners and start living as missionaries. I think that's one of the reasons God called me here, was to be able to wrestle together with you at the reality of what it means to get out of the comfort zone, to get into another subculture or culture, and try to be one of Christ's people there to declare Jesus and to demonstrate his kingdom. We've got to stop thinking in terms of what fits me and how we can be comfortable and instead think about what it means to step out of our comfort zone and learn to love, for Jesus' sake, people who are just different than we are. So if it's not natural for us and we want to be more culturally competent, how do we work at that? That's going to require all kinds of spiritual work. You've got to be motivated from the level of our spirituality to engage in this. But if that happens, how do we work on it? David Livermore, an internationally respected scholar, has outlined a few key skills associated with cultural competence. It's called CQ, cultural intelligence, instead of IQ. People who are consciously working on their competence in dealing with differences show the four strengths that I'm going to talk about. And I'd like to exhort you to consider cultivating those in your own life. First, CQ drive. Interest in cross-cultural experiences. People who get good at this have an internal desire to get better. They have a curiosity about other cultures, about people who are different. And they work at seeing things from another person's point of view. If you're going to get good at dealing with differences, you have to have some motivation. The second thing is CQ knowledge. These people seek cultural information to complete a task or to get deeper into a relationship. People who get better at competence are learners. They notice similarities and differences between cultures. They ask questions. They study. They listen before they talk. The third thing is CQ strategy. They make a plan. People who get good at dealing with cultural differences plan out strategies on how to do that better. They have a conscious strategy to include diverse people in their circle. It's not a matter of shooting from the hip. It's not even a matter of shooting from the hip when you're talking about someone my age having a good relationship with someone who's in their teens. There's stuff I've got to know. There's stuff I've got to learn. And I've got to kind of plan my approach. The fourth thing is adapt behavior, CQ action. These people are flexible and take appropriate action in light of what they now know. And they're, they willingly and thoughtfully change things and then evaluate to see if the changes work. This is a kind of lifestyle. And that lifestyle, it, this is very corporate in its language, but this demonstrates the skills 
that missionaries have when they go across cultures. All of these things are things that missionaries do. Now, all of the spiritual stuff is super important. It's more important. But once you get that settled, we need skills, and this is one of the ways to look at the cultivation of skills. This is what it looks like to be a missionary. So we have to make a decision. Are the missionaries just the people we send out overseas? For the better part of two centuries, the answer was yes, those are the missionaries. Unless they're going into, you know, rural something or the other in the wilderness in Alaska. Are they just those people? Or are we going to realize that because our country is becoming more diverse, each of us has to be a missionary? What would it look like if in every neighborhood where our members live, people were eager to cross these barriers, to have cross-cultural experiences? Even if it's cross-cultural with someone who looks like us and whose values are just so different. If they were willing to listen and learn about how we're different and how we're alike. If Christ's followers from Central were making plans at how to include new people different people into our circle of friends. If we were actually changing the words we use and the attitudes we carry in order to love and serve the person next door. A person that may be very different than we are. It's not just Israel who had this idea that we should just do our thing and other people will realize how wonderful it is and be eager to join us and be just like us. That was definitely Israel's problem. But it's often the church's problem as well. We want to just do our thing and then everybody will see how cool it is and want to become just like us. It's not only not biblical, it ain't going to happen. It's not the world we live in. Jesus has done, undone that sort of thinking. Jesus sent his disciples into all nations. We are the seekers. Jesus is making a church that has people of every color and ethnicity and language. And the book of Revelation celebrates that. It glorifies, it glories in the incredible breath of the love of God and its cultural impact. And Jesus is making a church right now that can incorporate the best from every culture, the art, the music, the customs, the language, that can all be used to praise and honor God. And if the church isn't starting to look a little more like that, are we really being the church? It's not always easy. There are going to be bumps in the road. But Jesus is the one who calls us to be that kind of church. And he's the one who is with us as we make our way forward. Let's pray. Lord, you've called us to make disciples of all nations. So help us now. As we try to live into that, as we encounter the all 